This is the modern world, and this is the fuel that makes it go round. Kofi doesn't get the respect it deserves for its contributions to democracy, the emergence of enlightenment ideas, and for the creation of the modern world. Side note, did you know that prior to the 15th century, Europe, and most of the world for that matter, never experienced anything with caffeine? How did they get anything done? Let's dive in a quick history lesson. Coffee has been consumed since time immemorial, according to Oromo oral tradition. However, coffee has not always been consumed in the way that it is now. Archaeologist Bula Wayesa describes one of the ways in which coffee was consumed by the Oromo people as they collected the ripe coffee berries from wild coffee trees, ground them with stone mortars, and mix the mash seeds and pulp with butter from which they formed small balls that they carried for sustenance during long journeys. Our first written evidence comes from a 10th century Arab physician called Razis, but it did not become all the rage until it was discovered by the spiritual slash mystical Muslims called the Sufis. Why? Because they used it as a way to keep awake during their nighttime prayers. By the late 15th century, coffee became very popular in the Muslim world, thanks in part to those Sufi mystics. By the early 1500s, students of the Al-Azhar University in Cairo were drinking coffee, and very soon people were drinking coffee in the square near the Grand Mosque. By the early 16th century, coffee made its way to Cairo, Damascus, and even the hallowed halls of the sacred mosque of Mecca. By 1554, two coffee houses also opened in Istanbul. Those two coffee houses focused specifically on the technique of making coffee especially then grinding, roasting, and brewing, in order to attract an elite clientele. Though, within a decade, there were 50 coffee houses in Istanbul, and by 1595, there were 600 coffee houses in Istanbul. Why did the coffee house become so popular in the Ottoman Empire? Because, for the very first time, there was a venue where Muslims could go to socialize other than the home or the mosque. During the 16th century, restaurants were virtually non-existent in the Ottoman Empire, and taverns which served alcohol were essentially forbidden to Muslims. The coffee house then became one of the first secular places where Muslim men could interact with non-family members. Also, it was one of the first places where someone could hang out at the evening hours. The coffee house offered a place where people could offer their hospitality and entertainment to their friends in an inexpensive way. In these coffee houses, people could smoke tobacco, drink coffee, play games like backgammon, listen to live music sometimes and do all sorts of things, including talking about the various grievances that they had with the empire. Okay, so I got tired standing up, and I need to have yet another coffee. So let's continue. Coffee played an even more important role in Ottoman politics, more specifically the elite guard of the Sultan, called the Janissaries, met frequently in coffee shops. There, they orchestrated Sultan Osman II's assassination. This created such an instability to the Sultanate that the next Sultan, Mustafa I, was actually deposed. When his nephew, Murad IV, who was also brother to Osman II, came to the throne, he did not want to repeat the mistakes that his uncle and his brother made. So, very quickly, he banned coffee houses 
in the Ottoman Empire. The punishment for operating a coffee house was cudgeling, and the punishment for a second offense was being sewn into a leather bag and thrown into the Bosphorus, essentially the death penalty. After Murad's reign, the ban was lifted and coffee shops continue working regularly. Slowly and steadily, coffee made its way elsewhere. Let's now move to England and what coffee did there. In the early 1650s, an Armenian or Greek called Pascal Rosé opened the first coffee shop in London. And in the next 10 years, there were 82 coffee houses in London and by the mid 18th century, there were 550 of them. The coffee house had all the ingredients to become popular. It served an exotic drink at a very affordable price. Anyone could attend these coffee houses and participate in all kinds of discussions. In a diary entry by Ralph Thorsby, we can see that the Royal Society held all kinds of events, including a live dissection of a dolphin attended by Newton and Halley themselves. Coffee houses became important centers of learning, discussion, and gossip. But more importantly, they became the place in which the public sphere has emerged. Coffee historian Stephen Topic argues about coffee's consumers. Consumers are involved in the Enlightenment, in capitalism, and bourgeois relations, and this, the public sphere, all these things coming out of the coffee house. By the public sphere, we mean, first of all, a realm of our social life in which something approaching public opinion can be formed. Access is guaranteed to all citizens. And indeed, something of a public sphere did emerge. Not even a decade after the first coffee shop opened in London, in 1660, the Marquis of Newcastle warned the king, every man is now become a stateman. People of all classes frequented them. And guess what? Even women could go to these coffee houses and many times they were partial owners or full owners of coffee houses. Coffee houses also served as places where business was conducted, more specifically transactions and business meetings took place in them. One coffee house, Jonathan's, was run as a stock exchange and another coffee house called the Lloyd became the world's most successful insurance company. In coffee houses like the Gresham, one could catch spirited discussions of philosophy, politics and science. Coffee houses make all sorts of people sociable. The rich and the poor meet together, as also do the learned and unlearned. It improves arts, merchandise, and all other knowledge. For here, an inquisitive man that aims at good learning may get more in an evening than he shall buy books in a month. In coffee houses, one could access printed media, newspapers, periodicals, pamphlets, and basically, if anything was in print, you could access it there. Because for a penny you could get a dish of coffee, coffee houses were nicknamed as penny universities. Even if someone was illiterate or of a lower social status, they could still participate in political discussions. And through gossip and through rumors, they could undermine political authority. But coffee became even more important than this. Benjamin Franklin wrote his famous letter to Lord North in the Smyrna coffee shop in London. Moreover, Boston's Green Dragon Tavern and Coffee Shop was described as the headquarters of the American Revolution. And the Merchant's Coffee House in New York was also associated with the American Revolution. Back in Europe, coffee was stirring the waters in yet another country, in France. Philosophers like Voltaire, Rousseau, and Diderot frequented coffee houses like the Procope. Two days before the French Revolution, Camille de Moulin cried to arms at 
Café de Foix. And now, let's bring our discussion to what coffee did in the 20th century. More specifically, coffee played an important role in anti-colonial sentiments. In the case of Singapore, coffee houses became very popular places of socialization and to get cheap meals. When the price of coffee was becoming too expensive in the British Empire, the people of Singapore formed themselves into a lobby public and actively sent letters to newspapers and the British colony itself. Furthermore, coffee shop owners also formed themselves into a lobby public and they staged such things as peaceful protests and gathering media attention. Coffee shop workers or assistants also formed themselves into a lobby group and they also sent out letters to newspapers and to the British Empire itself. Finally, the other kind of publics that emerged from coffee shops were the grapevine publics. Grapevine publics, through gossip and rumor, managed to undermine the British Empire. This is important because the communists spread anti-colonial sentiments, which infiltrated all of the unions that I mentioned earlier. The rumors and gossip spread by the communists created a level of distrust and fear, which led into violence and protests. Overall, coffee is not just a drink. It is literally the fuel that ran the creation of the modern world. And the coffee house is not just a place of leisure. There, people could learn, discuss, and actively take part in politics. And that is the legacy of coffee in the Western world. Next time you are enjoying a pumpkin spice latte or a Freddo Espresso if you are in Cyprus, just think back on the marvelous contributions of coffee and be grateful for this bitter nectar of the gods. If you enjoyed this video, try watching this video on the history of Carbonara or this video on the history of Margarita Pizza. Until the next one. Bye!